Hello, everyone. I want to thank you for joining us tonight for Cybersecurity Panel Event 2020. Um, I'd like to begin by introducing to you first the board members of our Los Angeles chapter. First of all, my name is Rick Peterson. I'm a database engineer from the telecommunications industry, and I'm serving currently as the president and the publicity chair for AITP Los Angeles chapter. And hopefully we have some of the board members with us here tonight. Um, uh, Carol, are you with us? I, I am with you, yes. Great, thank you for joining us this evening. And then I believe we have Nalu with us live. Can you say hello? Hi, this is Nilu. Nilu, thank you. Why don't you see our faces and a chance to hear our voices for, for the behind the scenes working hard to put this all together for your enjoyment. So thank you for attending tonight. Tonight we have a wide variety of panelists. They come all the way from Silicon Valley, locally in Los Angeles, and even south in Orange County. So we have a wide range of experts who are joining us this evening. I'd like to start off the panel by introducing our moderator, Dr. Stan Stahl. Um, He's known for founding Secure the Village, which is a nonprofit community-based response to the cybercrime and privacy crisis. A fun fact about Stan is that he began his career securing the teleconferencing system at the White House, which I think is pretty impressive. So he's been around for a while. And Stan, can you say hello? Sure, happy to. Uh, thank you so much, Rick. It's a real pleasure to be here and to get the opportunity to facilitate what is just a, an amazing panel. When you look at that, you know, we're, we're looking at very specific, uh, you know, a company, we're looking at the entertainment industry, we're looking at a global company, we're looking at a major provider in, in, in Google. Um, you know, it's, it's like our cup runneth over. Who could, who could ask for uh, any any more than that? So it's a real pleasure to be here to get the chance to, to facilitate this, this great panel. Uh, let me turn it over. George, tell us about yourself and we'll just run through the panelists and, uh, you know, the, let everybody introduce themselves that way. But thank you. Sure, I'm George Morris. I'm the CISO with OceanX LLC. We partner with some of the world's, you know, most recognizable direct-to-consumer brands and help launch and grow their platforms. Spent about 30 years in uh, infrastructure and security. Just glad for the uh, opportunity to spend the evening here. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, George. Sam, uh, introduce yourself, please. Sure. Um, happy to be here. Sam Sukon, uh, founder and CISO of uh, Intelligence. We are in cybersecurity. Um, consulting firm here in Orange County. We have uh, a couple of locations as well um, uh, in Texas and uh, uh, offshore. We are, um, we, we focus on risk-based uh, type of security uh, all the way from uh, monitoring to um, uh, implementations uh, and uh, uh, forensics. Well, great. Super gl so glad to have you as part of the team. And Eugene, you're, you're next. Uh -huh. Hi, I'm Everyone, I'm Eugene Tang with Amazon Studios. I'm in the Content Security Operations Division. Um, our group is responsible for protecting pre-release content, so that shows like the Marvel's Mrs. Maisel, Fleabag, and the upcoming Lord of the Rings series can reach Prime Video without any pre-release leaks. God, we need you guys to stay secure and keep providing us content while we stay at home, you know? Like, you're, you're vital to that. And, and Lakshmi, our, our last panelist, introduce yourself, please, also from, from Google. Hi, I'm Lakshmi Sharma. I'm Product Management Head for Networking at Google and Google Cloud. So um, our goal and mission for networking team is to offer the highest performing and the secure, most secure infrastructure that Google customers and Google services can have. So when I talk about services, I'm talking about search and I'm talking about YouTube and then Google Doc and all those services that you're used to kind of using from Google. So my team makes sure that all that entire infrastructure uh, stays up and secure. Yeah, very interesting. So as, as you can see uh, how broad the panel is, my own background uh, is very much involved, not just White House and things like that earlier in my career, but also the small business community, small and medium sized businesses where uh, we kind of focus. So I think we've got, as I said, a real nice broad area of expertise here, looking at the just the at the high level, the broad general question, it's, it's what you're seeing on your screen, security and privacy in the new normal. The world is changing, has changed 
in many different ways. We're looking on the one hand, of course, at COVID. We're looking at new privacy laws like CCPA and what looks like it will be yet another privacy law after the next election, as we've got something on our ballot here. Uh, we're looking at the, the drive to the cloud uh, and the, all the, the way the architecture of, of uh, the network is changing and so on. So lots of different things to talk about. Um, we're going to get started with uh, the obvious. We've, we've got to start with COVID. Um, George, why don't you introduce it to us? Uh, I'm good at being Captain Obvious, so thank you. Yeah, yeah COVID, COVID, you know, obviously, if I, if I look at how it shifted our company, it shifted in a few ways. I mean, we're, a, we're an SMB. We run about 1,100 employees, and we have a number of third-party service providers, mostly in North America. We do global call center and, and customer care out, you know, but, but the way it shifted us was primarily in the factor of a moving, moving our, our work populace to the home, which is, you know, we consider that a dirty Starbucks type environment. And also, but also we saw, you know, the prevalence of how we saw shift in, in fishing and spear fishing, you know, or, you know, just the numbers that we run from Feb to current, we're up almost 400% in the volume of phishing emails that have come through. And we have experienced a couple of minor events as a result of that. But I also think the, the, the other key piece to consider, and I know the larger, my larger co you know, company colleagues here can speak to this, is even global arbitrage was a challenge for us. Again, mm -hmm. we do call center and we do, we do customer care around the globe. And as we saw COVID hitting the various parts of our, of our global geography, we had to quickly make shifts and we watched all of our, you know, many of our call center agents having to also experience work from home, which put a special taxation on how good of a job did we do on our vendor due diligence? How do we know and how could we ensure that the at home user profile of the, of the call center agent who might be working in a, a PCI, you know, context in our company didn't present a new issue for us. Cause if we have challenges stateside, we mm -hmm. may have even worse challenges globally. So we saw a number of things like that. And I think, I think the, the other key final piece to this was how did this really affect the human element, the employee of the company? You had all the, th everything, you know, all these different things pulling at the attention of people. Folks were scared. They didn't know what shelter in place was going to be, how long it was going to take, what the lasting effects were going to be, who all, you know, may or may not, you know, perish as a result. But also you saw everything from, you know, reports from the CDC and the WHO and, you know, stimulus checks and all these things lended themselves very easily to a lot of attacks, especially in the form of phishing. You know, unfortunately, and we can talk about this a little bit later in the, in the broadcast, but, you know, it, as I do my own phishing campaigns against my company, I found it easier and easier to catch people that would have never been caught by such things. Mm -hmm. And again, when your attention spans diluted, that's a natural effect. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that's, that's clearly such a challenge. I mean, we're seeing it, of course, with all of our clients. Sam, I'm, see, I'm sure you're seeing it as, as well with yours. This whole work from home, I mean, we've got situations where uh, you can't get computers fast enough to put them in the home so people have to work on their dirty machines and, you know, just navigating that. Sam, talk a bit about some of what my, your experiences with, again, you've got a diversity of clients that you have to help manage through this. That, that is correct. Yes, yeah, so I guess the biggest challenge was to really dust off these BCP plans uh, and uh, bring them to life. Uh, you know, uh, if companies and depending on where they stand, if they really uh, did their, their planning properly, um, you know, they're in good shape. However, um, you know, when reality hits, it, it might be a different uh, scenario altogether. So uh, capacity planning, if, if you have remote connectivity uh, infrastructure, let's, let's put it that way, um, uh, you probably as an organization um, have everything in place for a subset of your entire headcount, um, you know, logging in remotely. The uh, situation in this particular incident is a little bit different. You know, also if you're an 1100 uh, uh, company like uh, uh, George here, uh, all of a sudden, you know, 1,100 people uh, are logging in remotely. So all these BCP and VR planning uh, exercises and drills and all that, all of a sudden they're coming to life. Um, so, you know, the question is, 
what happens if you don't have things under control uh, with you know EPP on the endpoints, uh, all the different security tools uh, on company issued laptops. You have you know BYOD people, uh, you know, and especially as you get into uh, probably executives, you know, don't want to carry a couple of laptops and they want to have their own uh, just a single laptop for personal and business. And then how do you secure that? Uh, how do you manage all of that? This is really the chaos and the challenge that, that started. And, you know, to, to really go back on George's, uh, uh, to, on George's comment uh, with regards to phishing, uh, the FBI reports a 300% increase on uh, cybercrime. Uh, related to phishing and spear phishing. And it's coming in all sorts of, um, uh, you know, uh, ideas. So for example, uh, things like, hey, uh, donate to charity emails are coming in and, and people mm -hmm. goodwill are clicking on that thing. You know, you, you know typically you don't do that. Uh, so you have that uh, one aspect. But the other aspect is really around um, working remotely in organizations where probably colleagues are asking you for, hey, what's that password to that account over email? You know, and, and typically that's a face-to-face -face conversation. So a lot of things are, are really, uh, uh, you know, changing uh, the way people normally uh, do mm -hmm. business and handle security. Yeah, yeah, so, so very, very charming. Everything I'm hearing you say matches both what I know from our experience with our clients and as well, what I see is I, you know, stay up on top of what's going on in the world. You know, I mean, uh, so it's just the, these kinds of challenges just kind of come to the fore in they really push hard on the BCP planning and all. And you know, Eugene, I want to jump over to you and, and kind of get what's it look like from well, specifically on the one side, the Amazon perspective, but more broadly, uh, the entertainment industry. I mean, you, you're part of, uh, for people who don't know it, the CDSA's uh, Trusted Partner Network on uh, helping build a secure infrastructure inside the entertainment industry. So kind of take us through what it looks like from, from your perspective that way. Yeah, so starting with the studio perspective, um, as Amazon employees, as a, as a tech company, we're all pretty good BC business continuity wise to work from home. So that hasn't been an issue, uh, or, or at least from, from our team's perspective, we haven't really seen employees having a problem with that. We all have, um, uh, we're all used to VPNing in and, and, and managing that. But the real challenge I think that all content creators are facing right now is um, production had to come to a, a complete standstill. So all everything that uh, was currently being, being filmed um, got shut down completely. So, um, our attention really turned to what had been filmed and making sure that those workflows continue, that they can keep going through post-production to meet our uh, deliverable dates. Uh, and um, and the, the tricky thing there is some vendors, uh, our content uh, security operations team found that there's a wide gamut of vendors that have that are, are, are prepared for that and on the other side where they are just not prepared <laughs> for that at all and trying to help them get through that and make sure that uh, if, if we send them content and they work on it remotely, um, that they can do that in as, as secure manner as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. then when production is spinning back up, um, that you've probably seen in the trades that uh, a number of uh, studios are starting up again. So the, the trick there is trying to make sure that we do that in as safe a way as possible. You know, this is all uncharted territory for, for all of all of the, the entertainment industry. So, um, but we're, we're tackling it with new innovative ideas, new technologies. And uh, I think it's going to be a uh, interesting uh, times ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it's what, what you're saying. I mean, when I when I look at, at the entertainment industry, and it's just I mean, it's such a network of companies and suppliers and sub suppliers and so on in the production process, and uh, very analogous in its own way, but different, of course, to the defense industry has the same kind of networking structure. But uh, the opportunity it would seem to provide guidance and education and, and all down through that. Uh, and we'll come back to that later, but I, I want to first go on to uh, Lakshmi, kind of get see the world from your perspective, if you will. Um, so why don't you jump in and, and, and share that with us? Uh, you may have some slides. I'm not sure if you do. Now's the right time for them. Feel free. Uh, okay. Yeah, however. Yeah. How about I start the presentation at three slides and then I will also address 
and the question that you have like you know how how google is seeing is or i'm seeing it so let me just start presenting and then we'll take it through that yeah go for it mm -hmm. you all see it mm -hmm. perfect <laughs> so um so there are many uh, you know i heard various things today like hey uh, what has COVID done? It has increased the um, demand on the capacity, whether it is your machine capacity, compute capacity, network capacity, or just the, where you store content, how do you access content? And uh, like, you know, where do you play it, right? Each of these things, whether it is a player running remote, whether it is a content which is storing that content, uh, whether it is a storage that, that you need for the content, whether you're caching something on your laptop, whether you're caching something on your client, everything, the demand for capacity, all the way from endpoint, which is a you know phone or laptop, it has increased. And where do you keep that? Where do you, where do you kind of make those calls about like distributed caching, distributed capacity, distributed uh, access? So all of that has has played a role, right? Uh, but all of these things have changed because the number of people who are working remotely or who are just who are staying home but doing a lot more things than they're home. So I'm not going to talk about all of them. Like, you know, I could, as I've said, like by networking and networking, uh, whether it's content caching, whether it's caching all of it, part of it, I'll focus on two things. Uh, remote working uh, situation for, um, for employees of a company, of an organization, or the customers of an organization. So what are the imperatives and what are the things we have seen? It basically, I'm, you know, to be honest, it's really most of the things which have already been said by my fellow panel panelists. So we have seen massive spike in remote workforce. Yeah, people like me and then like Eugene, we have been used to, we have seen this, we have worked from home, but not entire globe, not people in Asia, not people in Vietnam, not people in India, not people in Pakistan, those countries, people did not use to work from home as much. So the infrastructure was not right there, Brazil, South America, right? So we are talking about an increase in uh, work from home massively across the globe, right? So that mm -hmm. increase is spike, right? That's the spike we're talking about. And mm -hmm. there are untrusted network. If I talk about untrusted, so we have like Google has like close to 8,000 partnership with internet provider or maybe more around the globe. But net, not each of them, right? We, we go and build partnership with people who we know uh, will work in the kind of, you know, in the RAM or contract that we need for security. But then in order to have the reach that, that is needed today, a lot of them did not have that reach, right? So there are untrusted networks, there are untrusted homes, there are untrusted you know, devices. Mm -hmm. so, and they require access to these internet applications. So I'm sitting home, I'm using Zoom, I'm using you know, Salesforce, I'm using any other app, right? You know, talking about TikTok and all kinds of devices accessing all kinds of internet apps. So even as an employee, so I'm kind of mixing both the customer and the employee. So uh, the why I brought, it, brought TikTok, why did I bring, say Snapchat? Why do I bring? Because when I'm at home and it has already been said in the panel, that the types of devices, although you would assume that, hey, I'm home, I should only be using my work laptop, which I do because there is nothing else I can use to access everything for Google Cloud is like, everything for us is like all in cloud, every single document. So I cannot even access it from any other device, which is not my work laptop, but that's not how it is for all companies. You will have a key or you will have a dongle that you will put in. So there are all kinds of apparatus that you need in order to access a, you know, an internal application for your enterprise or for your working. So there are all, all kinds of issues that we have seen and the same aspect for your customers. So if let's say, and I take example of Target because I ran their cloud computer infrastructure. So if I'm Target and I'm, then I have these challenges which I described. I'm, I'm VP of product, I'm VP of cloud computer infrastructure. Then I have challenges which I described. Would, would my device work? Would my entire team's device work? Do, will it work right away? Would they, if I'm running a, a very mission critical launch for a product in target store, would all the hundreds of thousands of people be able to actually come to that website and there would not be any DOS attack, right? This, this never happened before, like to that massive scale. Mm -hmm. So now my customer, right? Now talk about target's customer. I'm a user, right? I go to target. I used to go online and shop, but I could go to work, you know, go to store as well. But now this is only online. So what is the experience? I'm going and it's basically you're talking about Black Friday every day, maybe a massive scale. That's what we have heard. So that's the term we have heard from search and other teams that it is, it is way beyond Black Friday kind of traffic that is coming to these websites. 
So what happens? You just heard phishing will happen. There will be account takeovers. And at the same time, imagine there are these government website, another website, you will see, oh, I want to make this insurance claim. I, I cannot run this, you know, I have mortgages to, there was never as uh, the amount of information to these websites. And because of that, people are entering a lot, lot more login information. They're putting a lot more uh, credit card information. So yeah, so one is that people are phishing because there is a lot more web access, other things. And because there are so many people entering their personal information. So there, we have seen, uh, you know, a growth in terms of um, host, you know, account takes over phishing and all, multiple bots running all the time on certain websites. So pretty common uh, to what I just saw and what, what, what my, you know, my uh, fellow uh, panelists have said. So what are we doing to protect? And then, so what, what has changed, right? So the things which have changed are, as I mentioned, which I've said, everything to me is an application, right? So that's not how it used to be for a lot of enterprises. They will say, I have an infrastructure and I put an application on top. So now we are, what, what I prefer is that I only see my application and I means like me as an employee of say Google or me as an employee of Target. The, biggest, the most uh, important thing for me would be that as, an, as a Google like, you know, company to control the security or Target is that if Lakshmi can only access financial applications from wherever she is, she should only see financial application. I wish I had a policy like that so that my infrastructure is never under attack, right? So there are there is a need for what you call like, we have a product, we call that Beyond Core. The idea is that everything should look like an internet endpoint to you and you should put your DOS uh, capability, you know, DOS prevention capabilities, identity management, all of that should be to just that service. You know, Lakshmi Sharma uh, sitting in, uh, California can only access financial applications of Google. Imagine if you could do all of that, then the attack that you have, the possibilities of attack that you have on infrastructure goes where, goes literally like you know to zero. So there, there are things that we had been doing, but the usage of it increased quite a bit uh, because of these capabilities we have. And next thing is, yeah, it's how do you even recognize, right? How did we know? How do you know? that I'm working from home, that I am like, you know, why is the traffic from my, my the laptop to my site or even to this financial application is going up or down? And I miss somebody has to measure that pattern. Somebody's always running some kind of machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithm because they will be like, the policy is that Lakshmi Sharma sitting in California can only access financial applications in Google Cloud. And maybe I would also add another policy saying that, uh, only from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. So if that is the policy, but how somebody has to monitor that all the time that if it goes above and beyond, right, then you are building some additional logic because maybe Lakshmi Sharma needs some additional time and because there was a specific meeting she needed to be in. So you continuously need security analytics. So there's a product called, you know, there's a company we acquired mm -hmm. called Chronicle. So that, that's what a job is, distributed security analytics. So analytics, becomes plays a huge role in this kind of environment when you have i would say billions of devices that we are talking about right yeah so what else i, I think these are the things that you you already have heard yeah so 91 percent of all targeted attacks started with phishing so that's where like you know i'm i'm like you know i'm managing my website and then somebody is just coming and then trying to do a phishing attack and then they become successful sometimes right and you're talking about billions of de these devices and i i know that we you know, if, if you, uh, some of you have heard these numbers that by 2022, there would be 50 billion devices and so many people using. So there are billions of devices already. And imagining all of them are, most of them were, have been working for the past three months, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. Fascinating, uh, actually. Which was not the case before. If you have two devices, maybe two, in your family, maybe you four or five, four or five members. So that's then the fraud and ATO. So same thing. So, uh, so yeah, I, I will, you know, I've already taken time. So, but I just, I'll just close with that. Yes, phishing. I, you heard about it. There were a lot more kind of account takes over takeovers, and then there are products that can help you. But collectively, as an industry, I think we need to do a lot more work. Yeah. Yeah. This is fascinating. Thanks, 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 Lashmi, uh, for that. I mean. Uh, I mean, it's just a common theme. I mean, just the way attacks are just up so much 
at this same time as we're struggling to go through this and, and the nature of those attacks. Um, I think this is, we've been going on for, I don't know, 20, 25 minutes maybe or so. Uh, let's stop and uh, take our first poll, which is all about COVID, our audience's experiences with COVID. And then we'll come back to talk more. We've, we've, we've just explored the whole, oh my God, the sky is falling world. Let's now, when we get back from the poll, talk a bit about kind of, well, down on the real ground, on, 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 on ground level, you know, what, how are we managing our way through this in addition to kind of what the practice, you know, what, what the challenges are. So here we go. Our first poll, how much did COVID shift your security posture? Mm -hmm. And then we'll bring you on, Rick, to give us the result of our polls. Yeah, I think it's only going to be maybe another 30 seconds or so. Okay. Or just take a look at what they had to, uh, what they had to tell us. Oh, well, I'll, I'll let you look at it. We seem to have a winner. Yeah. Interesting. So, yeah. And it's, 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 it's somewhat normalized. Uh, yeah. That definitely resonates. I know, you know, tactically, yeah. and we could talk a little bit about strategy down the line, but tactically, even, you know, back to the, the talk about move from home and, and Sam had talked about, you know, endpoint management products and, and components and Lakshmi talked about controlling the end agent. As, a, mm -hmm. as an SMB, again, I like to talk about our, our purchase decisions and our risk management around, you know, it's equitable to making oxygen choices at the top of Mount Everest. Sometimes you have to leave a lot of really good choices on the ground to pick up that one great choice that's going to move you forward and at least do what you need to do to keep yourself afloat. Yeah. Um, and, and interestingly, I mean, in our case, and I, I talked about this a little bit, you know, a lot of companies had to deal with, with um, either their colleagues were going on furlough and dealing with less staff to have to deal with more. In some cases, like in our company's case, we've had two of our best months in, in our history, which also proved a different, a different tangent for us. And mm -hmm. so again, that work for, that flux in workforce really, really tested our workforce continuity plans. It also exposed some gaps. I mean, I know a lot of us have, have run into tactical gaps. You know, I'll give you a very simple example. Um, a, a lot of folks out there in larger companies probably have their endpoint and their policy management dialed in and, and it's something they, they go to sleep about not worrying. In our case, we've had to go with the policy of no, um, no personal machines ever contacting the network, mm -hmm. using passive mechanisms to make sure that people weren't actually accessing us with private systems. And that even goes for our SaaS applications. But also, you know, the, a bigger key for us is um, even policy management. How do we get Active Directory to push down, you know, GPO updates to the clients if we didn't have something that could look outside and peer outside the firewall um, when they were moving around the globe? And so that's where I can, I can definitely, you know, resonate with moderate because we did have to make some, mm -hmm. we're having to make some active shifts and we've had to do some cleanup. Yeah. And again, but it was a nice, you know, COVID was a nice soft test and a soft landing, I think, of a lot of our BCP mm -hmm. and workforce continuity plans. That's I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to comment real quick. Uh, yeah, Sam. George uh, and, and Lakshmi mentioned something as well. So you can only imagine if you have to, to implement two-factor authentication, just take that as an example, in an organization of 1,000, 5,000, you know, the larger, the more complex. And now you have to, this is a, a, something that you, you typically do uh, you know, in a phased approach, uh, project that may take some time, and all of a sudden you're implementing this across the board, and how are you dealing? You know, that's a big challenge right there. Um, well, actually mentioned something about, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to, to not log in after a certain hour. So if you, in your security posture, you have, uh, you know, uh, uh, automation and orchestration in place, for example, uh, and the rules are such where uh, someone who's trying to log in after a certain uh, amount of you know, time uh, is getting locked out. Uh, you can only imagine the, if you're not monitoring that uh, and the, the headache and the overhead that you're dealing with in order to, to keep up and change the rules. Uh, it, I mean, it can get really complex. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I can see a lot of churning, just having to navigate through all of this stuff as, 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 as you're talking. Yeah. Um, I mean, what about the challenge uh, 
I guess if you've got corporate machines, it's, it's an easier problem. But the challenge when you can't get corporate machines, so you've got to work with the user's desktop. And now you've lost all your logging ability as well. Uh, you, you, you know, the best you can do is log at the entry point when they come into the net, into your network. How do you, how do you manage? Have you, how have you managed it? Or in some cases, have you just had to let it go? Sorry, we can't do that. Well, so in our case, I, I will say, uh, luckily we weren't in that position. I mean, we do have logging that's coming from the endpoints. Mm -hmm. We do have aggregation. And again, there's multiple methodologies you can use to make sure that you don't lose that, that visibility of the endpoint. In our case, you know, at the time that COVID hit, we didn't have a workforce that was fully used to using VPN. Mm -hmm. So we do have MFA and we've got, you know, we do have VPN and we have the capability to support the full workforce. But again, we could ensure that we still had our log aggregation occurring that we could mm -hmm. still collect. And for the most part, we could, we could work around the, the simple things like patch management and, and, you know, vulnerability management of the endpoints. So in that case, we were able to collect logs. I can't really speak for, um, you know, I, I would say that the only other thing I would have looked for is the passive mechanisms. If you're, if you're using a VPN endpoint, you have, for example, an IPS IDS engine that's inspecting that traffic as people hit your network. That would be a secondary, you know, component you could use to then use a some of, of an enforcement endpoint mm -hmm. and at least be able to capture logging who's in your who's connecting on your VPN, what geography are they coming from, all the logic and all the all of the components that watch. Hey, does it make sense that I had this user here in LA today, but now all of a sudden they're reporting over in 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 Bangkok? Um, uh, you know, yes. again, that's where you you definitely lean on your your sock and your your sim. Yeah, yeah. Uh, go ahead, somebody. You know, I just adding to that. I think I kind of uh, I mentioned already, but for us, like um, we because we use this, um, we don't use VPN tunnels. We use Beyond Cost, which is really policy based system. Right? There's a proxy that sits in that takes care of all the dots and it checks all these things. Right? What we, what you just mentioned because you mentioned like. MFA, screen lock. So for us, it was not a problem because we, at least as employees, we, were, we all had been operating in that model. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. know, I'm here for two and a half years. So it checks things like, hey, is your disk encrypted? Are you MFA? And then like, you know, which geography you're sitting, all these things which, uh, you know, which just uh, were mentioned. So we already do that and we, it's with VPN less. So the device is actually was not, a, not an issue. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Eugene. What what are some of the problems that uh, the the trusted partner network? I mean, as you look, begin to look down in the smaller, medium-sized businesses, um, where you know money is much more limited, and obviously, if you're a big company, uh, the attention span as well as is is limited and all. How are those companies? How do you see the you know how are they navigating through this? Right. So, so just for some background information, in case you're not familiar with the Trusted Partner Network or, or TPN, no. one of the the um, the things that the that the industry has done is in order to make it more efficient for the studios to do vendor security audits, rather than have each studio do a security audit of, of every single vendor, to leverage a common uh, platform to do that, and that's the what the TPN does, so that all the studios can reference one uh, common audit and uh, kind of relieve some of the burden on the vendor from having to get uh, audited by, by uh, multiple studios. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I can talk a, a little bit about, about some of those challenges. So uh, let me just share a screen real quick here. Yeah, sure. Um, so in order to, to make a, a film or TV show, you really does, it's not like the old days where you could do everything on, on the studio a lot. You really do need to leverage the best the industry has uh, from in, anywhere around the world. So whether it's a, a composer or a creative advertising vendor, a dubber, um, ADR or a digital grading, it can come from, from, from anywhere, especially once you take into consideration localization, which is dubbing and subtitling for uh, all the territories that you're going to release that content in. So the risk is, is really a worldwide risk that you have to, to, to address. And our, um, our, our internal audit team do the best they can to manage it. But um, as we saw uh, with the Larson Studios incident uh, a, a while back, um, 
the, 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 the weakest link is most often the vendors. So, um, so here's an incident that happened where a um, post sound mixing facility was hacked. And post sound mixing, in case you guys don't know, they're, they're the ones that combine um, the dialogue, the music, and the sound effects, and they mix it to the right level so that you can still hear the background music, but then still also hear the actors talking. So they need the whole episode, the whole movie in order to do that. So for a vendor like that to get hacked is, is a huge, huge deal. So, um, so this is a, an excerpt from a Variety article that uh, did an interview with them. Uh, and and the, the studio I used to work with had this, this issue. So um, it's really important to check those, 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 those facilities out and make sure that they're, uh, that they're secure. In this instance, uh, for Larson Studios, they had uh, a Windows 7 machine running RDP and uh, um, someone was able to exploit that um, over the holidays. It's always over the holidays when, um, when the defenses are down and get in and get to um, pre-release content. So, um, so that was uh, a good learning lesson for the entire industry and for, for vendors to, 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 to tighten up um, their security. Uh, but then also from perspective of, of, um, of COVID um, to take lessons le there learned and apply it to the home space. So Stan, great question. I think when you're looking at a, a commercial firewall versus a, um, something that, that, uh, that is an enterprise level, it's uh, it's very different, and our our our, aud our internal audit teams and the TPN auditors have to take that into consideration when they're um, evaluating a vendor that's working from home, um, because they can be all kinds of different setups. So, like on the left here, this is an example of a composer. And by the nature of what the composer does, they have a lot of expensive equipment in their home. They're going to do their best to secure it um, physically, and and we'll help them with the digital side. But then um, you also have other vendors that are only working out of their industry facilities. Uh, on the right there, they're they're setting up home shops sometimes in their in their in their kitchen or in their den out in the open where um, family members can come and and see what's going on. If they have uh, younger family members, they might take pictures and post on social media. So all kinds of things from both a physical security standpoint and a digital security standpoint that we have to take into consideration uh, to make sure that they're uh, as secure as possible. Yeah. No, I, I look at the one on the right, Eugene, and I, I just think to myself, you know, how many uh, Wi-Fi networks are there out in the world, families, right. apartments, you know, whose uh, password is hack me or password or QWERTY right. or, you know, what, whatever, their street number. Uh, yeah. And so, just, yeah, yeah. navigating. Okay. Right. Yeah. That, that's a, that's a, that's a, a very valid concern, but, but for the most part, our vendors understand the need for it. They, they're on corporate machines mm -hmm. um, for the most part. And, and yeah. uh, it's, it's really just about um, uh, making sure that the, the, how they're connecting is secure. Um, mm -hmm. Especially if they have no idea what uh, two factor authentication is or VPN is, it, it can be, yeah. uh, it can present some challenges there. Exactly. I mean, one of the things, just as this little sidebar, if you will, that I've always liked about the trusted partner network is the way that you're taking these security practices and pushing them down to these smaller companies who otherwise wouldn't know what to do. They wouldn't have that wherewithal. And that way, in, in many ways, you know, I see what CDSA is doing that way, very analogous to what we're trying to do in Secure the Village, that exact same way. How do we get all this information out to the, in our case, even families and, you know, one of our board members has a book called Cyber Guardian, a secure the village guide to residents, you know, that way, how do we help down to ground level? Uh, right. You know, and, and uh, TPN, Trusted Partner Network, is, is very much like that. Um, any other final thoughts on COVID and those challenges before we move on? Um, let me just stop for a second. Uh, Rick, get ready for the next poll. Yeah. Okay, well, we spent, good God, I just looked at the, at the time. It's really moving fast. Rick, why don't you put up the CCPA poll? Let, let's move from, you know, uh, how do we work from home and deal all of that stuff with, look, look at it, get some, at, at some legal issues. Yeah, it should be available for everyone to vote. Oh, I see people have begun voting. I want to click the one that seems most appropriate for our clients. No, we're starting to build a pattern here. Mm -hmm. Close to half our votes in, so. 
Okay. It's not taking too long. No, it looks like we might have a tie. We need some votes to break a tie. Come on, vote. Get your vote in. If you haven't voted. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want a tie. Can't have no ties. Nope. All right. So I think we're going to give it about another five seconds and we'll close the voting. So going once, twice. All right. Looks like the voting is pretty much settled down. So I'll go ahead and close the polls. I'll share the results for everyone. Just beat the tie. Ooh, it's not, it's, it's a double dip. Wow. Wow. As many are ready as aren't sure what it is. Okay. Uh, who, who wants to be the first to start with a short description of what CCPA is? Uh, well, I can I, I can take that. I actually uh, built a, a quick uh, deck here, so bear with me one okay. second, and I'll bring that up and go for it. Talk through our journey. Mm hmm. And let's see. Are you guys able to see my uh, screen? Uh, not quite yet, but I'm sure it'll be here soon. Let's try can we again. see it if the poll is still open? Let's go right again. Two. There we go. It's again. starting to come. Excellent. Bear with me. Problem mm. and share. It wasn't the, the technology. Nice photograph. Awesome. All right. So, so let's talk about CCPA, California Consumer Privacy Act. So at OceanX, you know, we're, we're, th we're considered a third party service provider. We, again, we, we work with major brands, Fortune 50 companies who, you know, have websites or direct to consumer um, business where, you know, they, they would fall into scope. And in our case, we had 20 plus brands slash companies that fill into CCPA scope. And so I would say we felt like we were starting late in the game when about last July, we finally brought together a, a, a project team to address um, being prepared and being ready by the first to be able to export data, to be able to delete data, to be able to comply with the 45 day timelines for export to delete and to be able to comply with, you know, do not sell. So with us, you know, we kind of looked at it as, wow, we've got a lot of work to do. This is like Y2K all over again. We, we, we knew that, you know, why, why did it matter to us? You know, of course we do Californians, we're gonna exercise their rights. You know, data collected, opt out of sale, export and delete. That third party service work provider, we knew we had all kinds of brands that qualified it, a minimum of 25 million in gross revenue or 50,000 you know, rec California records in, in our databases. We, and and the, the interesting thing for us is as we started our journey, the most onerous part of our project was where is all of that data? You know, a lot of us, you know, in, in smaller companies, you move fast and sometimes, you know, clean up and operational efficiency just kind of moves to the background. But, you know, in, in this case, we knew it was time. We've got to go out and we got to identify it. In our small company, we had 125 plus stores of data that were, that were in scope for CCPA. Wow. So for client impact, of course, we knew we had to get there by the first because, you know, we knew about the $2,500 for inadvertent violations. And we had heard the threats from, you know, the, that lawyers would sit and weaponize their, their lawsuits where they might save up a class action of 10,000 people and then have, you know, their, their law students sit there and plug in all the requests across three days and then see if companies can deal with, you know, processing those 10,000 requests in quote unquote 45 days. So, yeah. you know, for us, that was iceberg dead ahead. We knew we had to be up by the first and we knew, of course, for all of us that are involved in CCPA, it's one of the more ambiguous uh, legal entities that we've had to deal with. Yeah. Nothing for sure. We saw employee data come in and out. We saw, um, we saw scope. It was interpretation. Then the hardest part was even in the legal community, because there was ambiguity in the, in the law, um, your legal counsel, your privacy counsel may not necessarily agree. So what did we do? We, we started a chaotic dash, which really looked like a project. And we, we, we formed a team of about 17 folks. Um, but the reality is we did all this work. We brought together 
this team, we found all of our data, we, we found a vendor to front load and act as the, the, the vendor due diligence component for us if we did go through a lawsuit or one, excuse me, one of our clients went through a lawsuit. We, wanted, we, we needed to have the logs and the aggregation to prove the discipline that we had put in play. But the reality is on the first, it turned out to be crickets, at least in our little world. Between January 1st and the 14th, we had 15 deletion requests and nine do not sells. And in our case, none of our brands sold consumer data. So all they had to do was put a statement on their websites to help bypass that. And we had no interaction there. But the, the number of viable requests that we actually were required to respond to since week two, zero. We've had some requests come in, but they were unvalidated or they might be requests. They were, they were requests made by consumers where they weren't in our databases, whatever the case is. Mm -hmm. So we used our tools, we, we traced out what we did. But the key there was, this wasn't a completely lost opportunity. My CEO argues with me a little bit and he's given me his opinion on, on how our spend with, with CCPA has gone. But the reality is, we use that opportunity to finally identify and reduce the amount of data at hand. And again, with any, with any, you know, CISO, it's always about risk and reducing your attack, your attack vectors mm -hmm. and reducing your risk. And of course we were able to then go out and, and reduce our, our client risk. Yeah. At the end of the day, ocean X isn't going to get sued. The client is, but again, if our clients in trouble, we're in trouble. And then the last thing we did is again, it helped differentiate our platform, you know, in the, in the, in the verticals that we play in, being up and ready and being able to prove that we were able to go on one one and actually building an on ramp and building a, a, a compliance as a service for our customers actually was a big deal for us. So I think that's, that's kind of our journey. I know it's different for other people. I'm curious how seeing that poll um, is interesting to me, but again, at the end of the day, um, when I say we were 100% ready, um, this wasn't full integration. We didn't have, you know, automated routines climbing into all of our applications. We had 125 scripts that are going across databases or unstructured data to search and find. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's not a simple thing, but yeah, on average, you know, for those requests we've had to fulfill, we've done it in under three days, which is again, very important to our clients. Cause I hate to say most of our clients aren't even, a lot of them fall in the same place where they're like, what's CCPA? And, and hopefully yeah. they don't learn by the lawsuit. Yeah. As you say, hopefully they don't learn by the lawsuits uh, because they are happening already. Uh, there was a lawsuit filed in the San Francisco Division of the United States District Court uh, not too long ago. Uh, defendants being a company called Hannah Anderson and Salesforce.com, uh, where the allegation is that there's a failure to protect this uh, information, uh, which is one of the other sides of CCPA. Uh, there's a responsibility for reasonable security practices. And so the allegation is that uh, Hannah Anderson and Salesforce do not have in this circumstance uh, re reasonable practices here. My sense of one of the things, Secure the Village has done a lot of work on uh, CCPA readiness. We've got uh, four webinars on our website, securethevillage.org, um, all devoted to CCPA uh, it, discussions, both with the technology people and, and the attorneys. Uh, it's a challenge, uh, everything we're seeing out there. I mean, kudos to you guys, George, that, that you've gone through this. Uh, everybody that we talk to, the value of getting all that information under control is not just for CCPA, so you can find it, uh, but it's what we just talked about for COVID as well. That when business continuity issues hit, you know where your information is now. You, right. That's so much better under control. So you know, we, we find uh, you know that that's been a real a real plus. Sam, what are your experiences out there? So uh, honestly, uh, to, to, you know, th there's a lot of there was before uh, January first a lot of prep work, we uh, engaged with clients uh, who wanted to understand their data. Uh, you know, uh, what do they have? Where does it reside? And I can tell you from, from experience and working with, with clients, um, it wasn't more of a CCPA uh, readiness, uh, but rather more of 
hey, I'm concerned about my data. I have PII um, data out there. I don't know where it is. Um, people were supposed to leave it on, on our secure file system on premise. Um, but guess what? <clears throat> what? We have um, cloud instances as well. Uh, data could be out there. Uh, same thing with um, email. Can be sitting in email, uh, scan documents of, you know, PII data as well. So uh, it, it's more of getting engaged with clients who really wanted to understand that first, uh, uh, you know, understanding the, the data, uh, classifying the data, tagging the data, and then based on that, uh, moving forward with certain action, actionable items as far as well, this is sensitive data. Why is it sitting on someone's desktop? Mm -hmm. uh, moving it to this uh, secure lockdown, you know, uh, vault, vaulted uh, file system, for example. Um, and I need to know who accessed this file system, when, and, and you know, did they have that? You know, certain certain members can only have that read-only access versus modify access. Uh, setting alerts uh, if that vault is accessed. Um, really maturing that whole uh, uh, data governance component from a cybersecurity perspective mm -hmm. it has been my experience rather than just dealing with the lawsuits and, and, and everything else related to that. Yeah, no, I, I find that, as you just said, so valuable because it raises the game. Uh, that level. We have a question, and I'm not sure that anybody on our panel, frankly, is appropriate to answer it. What's the differences between CCPA and GDPR? I mean, one's California, one's the European Union. Uh, and I mean, the, the real, the depth of that answer is all legal stuff. But uh, because, it, and I'm thinking, looking both at George and, and Sam, uh, because you are global, uh, what are the practical differences, I guess, maybe is the right question? Um, you know, th th that you've seen? I mean, how, how have each affected your businesses? And, you know, I mean, maybe Lakshmi and Eugene, you want to jump in here as well as, but I've, I've been looking at Jordan and Sam on my screen and knowing you're both global that way that let's start with, with you two. Um, yeah, so yeah. go ahead, Lakshmi. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, so I would say how it has impacted now or before. So good news is that because uh, GDPR, I'll speak to GDPR. I'm not really an expert on CCPA. So, um, so uh, there was a requirement as of last year, right? At a certain, spe by certain specific date, all the cloud providers uh, have to be GDPR compliant, like by a certain thing. So good news is that <laughs> uh, we had, we worked through that, we, you know, as an entire organization, we, we were GDPR compliant at a specific requirement because otherwise you kind of could not even operate into that. And what is it about? So the, in short, it is about, so where are the boundaries between like, hey, I'm a user, right? And I, I use your cloud and uh, I put my data and where is the boundary between what is personal data versus, versus data for an infrastructure company? So there were certain regulation, there were certain rules and like uh, concepts defined and which each of you know we, each of the infrastructure companies had to go through. Okay, for if you sit in this country and this is kind of application you run, this is the business you run. So there are a lot of those rules and kind of regulations which each of companies like ours, was Google Cloud, had to go and test and check. A lot of work was done. A lot of engineering effort was done. A lot of, of course, legal was done too. So I think that's what it is, and I think it was a very good timely effort. Uh, you, know, you know, somebody saw like at <laughs> some place COVID coming. Uh, while last year it was primarily like uh, legal and those kinds of um, uh, security related reasons that it happened. <clears throat> Brexit was also one of the things, but uh, post that work that happened, I think it all it is it was all in the interest of most of the population of the world uh, that those regulations kind of ended up playing a big role and helping people like, you know, now in these situations. Interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, the, the only comment I was going to make to your point that you brought up, Stan, and again, this is not offering legal advice, so there's the, there's the, uh, the, the legal comment. Um, I'm not a GDPR expert because, again, we don't, while we have third-party service providers that sit globally, our data sits in North America. But CCPA and the main difference that I see between the two is um, the, the way that you define PI or private, you know, personal information they consider that to be quote unquote household data, whereas GDPR is, is, is personal. 
like in the case of in the case of CCPA, um, and again, every lawyer may have a different take on this, but things as simple as IP addresses, things like, you know, you got first name, last name, addresses, those are all the easy stuff when it comes to, to PI, but something, any element that can tie back to an individual user with, you know, being able to go out and determine another piece of info um, is considered PI under the scope of CCPA. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is that differs a little bit from GDPR, but again, I'm not an expert on both. Yeah. That's, that's my main understanding. Yeah. And I'm, my understanding is consistent with yours, but that doesn't make us both right. <laughs> well, the reality <laughs> is, I mean, it, with that ambiguity, that's why we leaned on, on yeah. the, the, what, what GDPR had done and also the lawsuits yeah. that we had seen in GDPR to help make informed decisions on how we should take a track with CCPA. Exactly, it would, it, our situation, we always wanna work with our clients' attorneys so that we get agreement on exactly, you know, what are we talking about here? Sam, jump in. Uh, honestly, uh, I'm, this is all legal, right? So, uh, and more and more states are coming up with their own privacy laws um, all the time. And I think in a matter of just a couple of years or so, we're gonna have in the United States, if not before then, uh, privacy laws like CCPA here in California, there's a, another version of it uh, already, um, a version two, I guess, CCPA two. Um, but uh, GDPR really dealt with the European uh, component. Um, I dealt with it uh, before uh, when I was an uh, uh, SVP of, of uh, IT and security. Uh, where data had to reside in our European offices uh, versus data that had to reside in um, uh, the U.S. altogether. So it was that type of exercise and engagement from data separation, identifying it, getting ready, um, and so forth. And that was that was a journey. That was several months worth of uh, mm -hmm. an exercise. Uh, now CCPAs, it, to uh, the, the points that you guys uh, brought up here. It's, it's a little bit different. Um, anything, facial recognition cameras, as we move into, hey, do you have a mask on with AI now? And, and are you doing social distancing properly? Uh, there's a lot of streaming software and video that's, that's doing all of this. And we're gonna see a lot more of it um, in, in, in movie theaters, at the mall, mm -hmm. uh, and so forth. It's, um, at the end of the day, it's what, what is considered personal uh, data and where are you storing it and what are you doing with it uh, mm -hmm. or more of what, what uh, CCPA uh, CC Yeah, yeah. Good point. You don't have these challenges, Eugene, is that right? Because you're on the content side. Yeah, it, it, that's true. Um, naturally, you think that Amazon would have a, a ton of CCPA issues and I'm sure that that the, the, the retail side of things and the, the Amazon corporate people are all got their hands mm. full with it. But Amazon Studios, no, we don't have that issue. Our, our primary objective is to create the content and, uh, and get it ready for prime video. And, and mm -hmm. uh, so we don't really touch any end user personal information. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Uh, got a couple of questions from the, the, the audience I wanna move to. And um, one of them, it's, it's, I find rather provocative, if you will. Uh, I'll read it. Before COVID, so many organizations thought that they were saving money by BYOD. The security risks before COVID were great. Now they are enormous. Please speak to how to convince non-IT decision makers that BYOD is insecure and prone to legal liability. Also, it's a real challenge, of course, for IT people to maintain. Uh, you know, the, the, yeah. I'm going to comment real quick. Just uh, tell that user uh, I'm installing uh, antivirus on your personal machine. Uh, and if anything happens uh, to it, it's not my responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, I say that jokingly. It's, it's really uh, a, uh, a question of culture, um, company culture, as well as the politics. But um, one way is to obviously stand firm on the security principle and just say, look, uh, it's for the protection of the organization. Um, and uh, the, uh, this is the only way we're gonna do it. Uh, the, you know, again, I, I say this, depending on the organization, some companies may allow it. Um, and 
I go back to what I said earlier. Uh, you may want to install certain software. You may want to, um, uh, you know, from HTTP to other security tools, all the way to ensuring that um, you're coming through maybe VPN. Uh, and then it goes from, can you VPN without the software in place? Can you check on, on that first before you connect and make a successful connection? It gets a little more more tricky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think it's interesting that, for, that uh, from an IT perspective, all IT professionals, when they're faced with this kind of question, they always have to, to weigh the costs, right? So if, if the cost of, of buying all of the, the mobile devices uh, for the, the end users, implementing a, a mobile device management system, if that's greater than the risk that you've calculated, you're, you're not going to win that fight. So uh, it, it really does come to, to showing management the, the dollar value of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, that's, and that's key. Yeah. Um, otherwise, it's 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 a it's it's probably not going to happen. Yeah. I was going to echo the very same thing. Go ahead, Lakshmi. Sorry. So it it really depends on company policy. I think that's a that's where it starts. Like, if the company decides that no matter what, I would not, <laughs> um, you know, and and I would not just allow anything which breaches my security. Like Google is one of those companies. We would rather we are hiring people and then very senior level, all kinds of level. We need somebody now, but even if it delays, you you cannot even receive a mail from Google account. You cannot be on a call. Period. So so it's kind of that's how it is. Like it has to be certified, done, and for your own. So like if I am engineering product, I can I will get a I let a laptop which allows me even on frame encryption and perspective it would notice that what all applications. So I think it depends on uh, company policy. So like uh, at least where, where I am, which company I am, it's, it's okay to be non-productive, but not wish this, <laughs> not just have any other device, which is not yeah. blessed by the IT. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. 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 I was gonna say, looking at Susan's yeah. question, and I say, I see where she says, please speak how to convince non-IT decision makers. Again, I, I report to the GM and who, then, you know, the CEO. And so my GM always, you know, jokingly tells me, put things in terms that a golden retriever could understand. So, so part of that is about socializing and simplifying the story. Yeah. The reality, like, like Eugene, you know, hit on is the way you can always frame conversations to just show what's the TCO, what's that total cost of ownership. Yeah. So there's, there's the risk, there's the risk in the attack surface and the risk management approach. But the reality is there are a lot of fallacious arguments out there around how BYOD can be cheaper. I'm sure in some cases you can find it, but there's always hidden costs that show over time in my experience when you look at BYOD as an approach. And it's, it's, it goes beyond, hey, I've got devices that are no longer compliant. I've got devices that are, that are insecure and present a, an attack surface. Um, you, you know, you've got things like I've got to, you know, like Sam mentioned, I need to be able to get it on a device and do a remote wipe. I need to be able to control the device that's your device that, you also mm -hmm. conduct personal business on. But I think one of the biggest things you can do when it comes to talking to your, your C-levels around um, BYOD is there is, a, there is an upfront cost, which is the resourcing and the capacity that it's going to take to purchase all the tools, software, resources, operational support, 24 by 7 eyes, log management, security controls, patch management around all those individual unique systems. I mean, look at phones alone, all the different types of phones you got to deal with, much less laptops on the market. But then there's the hidden cost of what happens when it's time to come to your compliance. You're doing PCI, you're doing, you know, PCI is not going to fly with BYOD. It's just never going to happen. But even <laughs> things as simple as SOC 2 or ISO 27001, you push your policy enforcement out into the individual's choice on equipment and then your poor help desk and your poor service delivery teams are just crushed when they spend 50 percent of their time trying to figure out how to mm -hmm. help support and fix problems that are occurring with all these myriad different choices amongst your users yeah just personally i'm totally against byod mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I, I just, yeah i think there are mm -hmm. Um, so plus hundred to everything that you said, George. Like 
all these it's just kind of you know even if we pick and if we are looking for a data like idc actually runs you know idc is an analyst company that runs certain reports around how much does it cost extra just to do patching for example across mm-hmm. different kinds of devices right so there are there are proven reports and results per device cost that adds up to every device that you have and each of the flavors that uh, george you pointed to which is uh, you know just not the, and even if we just look at each of these three things socks and then pci that you talked about there will be a cost to each of them so so if you're looking for some uh, because cxos they look they they sometimes you know are look happy looking at external data which is coming from analysts and some kind of reports so idc actually published some end device data mm-hmm. on that yeah 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 i, th- I think all all of what you're all saying to to me just absolutely tracks well i mean part of the challenge because i i george i'm I'm like with you i i would hate to see byod except the reality and again when you're working with small companies often and i'm sure eugene you see this the same thing down in the you know the sole proprietor tpn kind of space uh it's really hard when or, you know, ma- managing security is already a challenge for them because they're so resource constrained. And now you want to impose things like no what BYOD and, and so on. So, I mean, I always on the one side, take the strategy of, okay, so, all right, so if you got to do BYOD, what's, what do you, what's the minimum you got to put on it? And I think that goes to your point, Sam, you know, we've still got to be able to monitor it, manage it, be able to wipe it, all of, all of those things. And I think the, the other thing is as, as well, and this goes to Susan, uh, to your question, if you can help that non-IT professional understand that, okay, you've got, it's something as simple as a BYOD, somebody's Android phone, let's say, or, or even it could be an iPhone, it gets breached. What's the consequence of that? It's a small little event, that breach of that device, but that can lead, of course, to a penetration of the network, which can lead to a ransomware attack, an espionage attack, uh, theft of credit cards, business email compromise. What's the cost of those things? What's the likelihood of those things? And it's climbing because of COVID. We know that. So that uh, the consequences of BYOD uh, now become much more significant. And, and perhaps if we're lucky, uh, that non-IT professional can begin to understand this stuff. Yep. Yeah. You know, there's an interesting, uh, I see a comment in the, in the chat that somebody's also asked, what about forcing users through a bastion, a bastion server? Mm-hmm. So, you know, one of the things we talked to, or we didn't talk about, but of course you could also drive, you know, BYOD through a clean front end that becomes your jump into your, your, your mm-hmm. private network. Um, again, I, I know folks would, would probably argue with me and hopefully I didn't offend anybody in the audience, but when I look at things like PCI and, you know, PCI is obviously very, pres- you know, prescriptive and specific 400 plus controls around your environment. Um, but the way I always look at PCI and when I think about BYOD in the home environment, is at the end of the day, I can have a device, I could be sitting on an iPad and I can get into a jump server, I can get into a virtual server farm, get a virtual host, and then I can start making my jumps into the secure zone all through permissions. And it's, it sounds like a great idea. It sounds like you're clean when you hit the, when you hit the bastion host. The problem is if I'm sitting at home, working on a personal system that's been infected, I've got a keystroke logger on my personal system, it's still gonna capture my passwords. It's gonna capture my keystrokes as I jump into my secure zones. And again, there's just in, in my mind, the, the pain to try to protect against that, that eventuality far exceeds in cost. Yeah. Just making the decision you know, to, to do your, your policy and endpoint management at the virtual server farm entering the network. No, I, I agree, um, George. I think it's it's back to that uh, really um, basics, I guess, of uh, information security, uh, right? How do you assess risk? What is risk? Uh, quantitative versus you know uh, qualitative. I mean, let's talk about you know you, you can you can put that dollar amount there with all the difficulties of managing and, and deployments and everything else uh, of personal devices. Um, it, it, if you touch on the, the, the if our name is, it is in the news, basically, um, you know, what dollar amount do you, do you put next to that? So you have these two basics um, 
uh, that you can you can fall back to to really show and discuss uh, with management that that really can sway the decision. Uh, just something came up on the screen, just on this now, uh, from Vivek Tao. Um, so my question is for people rejecting BYOD, with so much work being done on phones. Um, it, it, it seems like the answer is the corporate phone. I mean, the, the corporation buys the phone. That's what your solution is, George and, and Sam. I mean, if you're not going to use BYOD, um, well, I, and I don't want to be I don't want to be hypocritical here because I will admit in our organization we do have we do have use of personal cell phones. We made the decision to move away from VoIP in our corporate office because a lack of use was so low, but b um, you know cellular use is so high. So you have a BYOD element there, and yes, people can put email on their on their phone, and you've got a control agent there. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, you know, from my, from my personal perspective, um, should, should the company, per, you know, issue phones? Yes, we used to issue phones. And that was something that we had to manage. And again, there's a cost to that component. Um, and there's part of an FTE that has to manage the plans and the, you know, all those configurations. In my, in my point, I would say that the happy balance for us, given that we're an SMB, is we've done better without without having the company issue the phones. We have not had an event yet where there was a compromise related to an application on the phone, but I can also tell you that we don't allow the phones to VPN and dive into the network, even though a user could, you know, install a client out of their app store and use their credentials to try to come in. But we would see that and we would enforce it at the at the firewall. Mm -hmm. um, and we also, again, um, control the, it, it's with the ability of, you know, having the BYOD phone, the caveat in, in our policy and in our approach is we reserve the right to delete. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I think same here. So in each of the companies I work, because BYOD for phones started way, way before and there are limited access. I think the point summarizing what I just heard is that there are more limits and controls that you can put in when you have BYOD. And there are applications like MDM, right? They were meant for that, that, hey, I have full access to your phone and I will wipe everything off anywhere, right? Because so I think those devices, those and applications have been built because there's an agent sitting, right? So that's mm -hmm. the kind of difference. I think your phones are allowed and because there is, you, you but, but you put all those policies which were just described. Hey, I'm, I can just take away even your control. I can wipe off even because even your pictures and your emails. So are you willing to do that, right? So there are a lot tighter controls when you use a mobile device versus like say a laptop and, uh, and but that happens. Yeah, I think BYRD was for phones I've seen in most of the companies, but all, the reason being also, I think because this M, the use of MDM and the use of the mobile device management and how you can remotely do certain things because you do not allow everything. You just allow certain access to certain mm -hmm. things. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Eugene, um, you're, let's say again, I'm, I'm thinking down the post-production, not, not Amazon Studios, but, but down into the, the, the production, how post-production and, and, and things like that. I mean, I, I would think, just looking at the Larson Studio, for example, if I could take a cell phone into the room where I'm doing post-production and I've got the camera on the cell phone to take maybe still shots of the movie, uh, I could download onto the cell phone. What are the... What, 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 you know, what, what are the rules, so to speak, around BYOD and things like that in, in, in TPN? Yeah, so the, depending, so mobile devices, it's, it's a huge gap in the media and entertainment space that you have to, to, to accommodate the risk for. So it, we all have a high definition camera in our pockets yeah. that we're walking around with every day. On, in, in the production space, there's certain things you can do. You can, um, you, you can, if people need their phones in order to, for work purposes to text, there's uh, certain security labels that you can put. They're called pick patch labels that you can put on the, on the cameras on the front and back. Uh, and if someone removes it, um, the uh, lettering will appear on there saying that it's uh, void or uh, that to indicate that someone took the label off uh, and just have security check that um, uh, whenever people break for lunch or leave the set before they come back on. Uh, if they don't need access to their phones, there's things like um, 
uh, yonder pouches, which are commonly used at concerts and comedy shows now, but are seen more and more at purely screenings on set or even in post-production houses where you don't want people to walk around with, with cameras. And in those instances, uh, rather than the old days where people would bag and tag uh, attendees' phones uh, before they go into the, the test screening, they would just let them keep the phone on them, but they have to go into that yonder pouch that's um, magnetically sealed and without the unlocking base, they can't unlock it. And that, and that kind of alleviated a lot of the headaches from the, the studio security side because um, you don't want to have to be responsible for losing someone's phone or dropping right. it or something like that. They keep the phone with them the whole time. They just can't access it um, without exiting the building and, mm -hmm. and getting to the, the unlocking uh, base. So there's all kinds of uh, ways to, to approach that, um, that um, the industry is kind of uh, found um, and we repurposed from other areas. Interesting. Yeah. Any final thoughts on this before we bring up another poll and then kind of begin to take it home? On the BYOD things? Okay. Uh, Rick, why don't you put up another poll? Pick one at random. Let's uh, surprise us. We're, we're kind of winding down. It's late in the evening. In the poll. Yeah, so long as you don't answer yourself. So, yeah. <laughs> ah, this is mine. <laughs> you asked for it. Yeah. Hmm. My work. So we got votes coming in. Okay. For almost half of us. Wow. Are disciplined. <laughs> Good. Good. We're glad to hear we're uh, helping. That wasn't my answer. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, as as I said, um, th this was my polling question, and it's it's, it's somewhat tongue in cheek and facetious, but it's also actually it's a good segue for kind of winding down the, the 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 event. The idea here is we all know you want to manage anything, you've got to manage it. Uh, whether you're talking about finance operations, your grocery store list, you know, management in some sense is management. Uh, and it takes a certain amount of discipline. And one of the things we see, particularly in, in, in the smaller business community, I mean, again, looking at Eugene, Eugene with the TPN program down into smaller companies, it's really a challenge to get a cadence of cybersecurity, a discipline of cybersecurity going to where you're managing it in an ongoing way. Not all companies are fortunate, George, to have a full-time CISO. Uh, Sam, I mean, you work in the same space we do, where if you can get resources to look at security once a month, you're doing good, because that's all the bandwidth that a client's got. Um, and you've got, Eugene, all the way from Amazon Studios, where, by God, you know, you talk about disciplined, holistic, you know, you're on top of this stuff because you're talking content. But then you see how as you go down the network, down the supply chain, how it becomes just such a greater challenge for these smaller companies. Question we haven't taken up because, uh, but it deals with CMMC, the uh, capability maturity model, the DOD is in our is introducing, which is in its own way analogous to the trusted partner network, uh, and analogous but different, but pushing security down the supply chain. As you get lower there, it gets harder to maintain that discipline. It gets harder. I mean, George, you, you're big enough, you, you are your own coach, and you got resources available to you. If you get something that you don't know about, you can pick up the phone, you know who to call. Sam, you provide that resource for your clients in, in, in many ways. In our own way, Secure the Village is the coach for those who can't afford a coach. You know, we, we want to provide that, that kind of information. So let's spend a few minutes talking about the discipline of information security management, if you will, what that takes, what that looks like in your different environments. Um, and sure. yeah, maybe George, you know, you're, sure. you're not shy, you could you'll jump in and share this. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, when I think about discipline, I mean, uh, all roads to me lead back to people and, and the human element. And I think the you know, one of the components, you know, we haven't really touched on yet today, but it's near and dear to my heart is, you know, our, our, I mentioned our companies made the decision we're, we're not going back to, we'll be work from home from this point on. Mm -hmm. We've gone from being face to face to completely, you know, pulled apart. 
and we've all worked in companies or we work today in companies that are used to matrix management and sometimes we have global teams. But the reality is in a company, especially a small company that's not used to that, um, this change, you have to worry, you know, one of the leadership things we have to consider both from a cybersecurity perspective, but really a true leadership perspective is how do we make sure we don't drain our culture? And how do we make sure we don't lose our culture? You know, one thing I've, I've really, really been doing a, a personal effort on for a good year and a half is um, getting as many opportunities as I could. My CEO has been gracious enough to give me the opportunities to get up and speak at town halls and, mm. and really bring security to the forefront of the organization. And he's been a great champion. He's, he's been in many, many cases where he'll get up and say one of the three things that keeps him up at night is security. Just takes one bad event to put your name in the papers in a, in, a, in a devastating way. But for us, I really think about all the work we've done, especially around our phishing campaigns and, and bring, getting people involved in security and actually having fun with it. I've mm -hmm. got vice presidents that fish their own teams to mess with them and make sure they're paying attention. And that's when you know your culture has changed and it, it's moving in a good direction. Mm -hmm. But when you start to pull yourself apart where you're living on a, you know, basically a video conference lifestyle. And a lot of times we, you know, when we start a communication, we even leave the video off. You have to be very intentional to work on the culture and work on the discipline. And so I think more than ever to your question about disciplines and security, one is all we, you know, we always take the same approach. It's security first, compliance second. Compliance just proves that you're doing what you say and saying what you do. Um, but the reality is, you still have to live, eat and breathe security every opportunity. You have to communicate early and often. You have to go ahead and be vocal about your failures and you have to present those and you have to use, use every opportunity as a learning opportunity. And I think those are key. And I think, again, things like people have talked about virtual, you know, virtual happy hours and virtual, you know, getting together and do, you know, playing games, even within the teams, I think is very important because over the course of time, in companies that used to be fully face to face, I think, you know, we don't have all that much data. We can't predict that we're going to look and feel like a, you know, a geographically dispersed, you know, matrix management team. And so I think we need to watch that because we will lose some people over the course of time simply because the model doesn't fit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, go ahead. Yeah, so, uh, you know, culture, uh, you mentioned, so which is not related to security, but I'm, I'm also like, you know, big on to uh, the cultural aspect. So in order to do deliver the best thing security, no matter what you want to deliver, there is a each company has its own culture. And that's why people come in. That's why you get to kind of have the best win. I 100% agree what has just been said. The biggest, biggest uh, kind of concern for me as well is like in these days is that how do I, uh, and then people like, you know, the my teams are all over the world. There are different languages. There are different personality styles. So to kind of, and by and myself actually taking a lot of trainings on how to, how to run an effective virtual meeting, right? And I, I talk to customers, I talk to partners, and I talk to my own teams. So how do you make like 50 people talk at the same time without everybody running on to each other, right? So I think that's, I, I completely agree that how do you be, uh, how are you being effective and efficient in operations while you make sure that that people are actually being heard of. And so that that's definitely going to be a challenge which is a generic challenge. On the security practice side, so I think I want to touch upon, so here as well as like my previous company, I'll take example of Target. And um, many years ago, like I think it's close to 2013. So there, uh, Target had a security breach and that was all across the, you know, around the world, paper. And then like any other company, they would just, then that that's the time they set up the CISO practice and everything. So where it originated, it originated from a point of sales, like right, camera, and not something which was active, something which was not active. Right? It's just sitting and then, but it just happens to be on the network. Mm -hmm. So and when you think about Target as a company, it's like really a big company, but when you think about the IT organization, at least at that time, it was not such a large organization, right? And so how do you, um, so from that perspective, what, what should companies be doing and what should practices be? But I, I, again, another person, another thing I would say plus one is that compliance comes later and security comes first, right? So it's very important that, and what are you securing, right? If you're, and, and most important, let's say to me, somebody who lives in, uh, in technology industry, IT, right? 
IP and the information and data of your customers, my customers, my IP, which is my software, my hardware and all of that, as well as information that my customers put onto Google. So those are the two things that are most important, right? The thing is every company will have to now make those decisions that yes, the increase on demand on security has increased, but what is most important to you are like compliance or security. If I put security first, security is the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well said. Eugene, you wanna? Yeah, I think 100% dis discipline is, is really important, but I think it's, it's interesting right now, you have to remember to be flexible too. It's not talking just from content security, but from the entertainment industry as a whole. Um, it's it, for a long time, the entertainment industry was relying for content transfers on this archaic uh, physical medium called DigiBeta to move content around. And mm -hmm. it wasn't until the Fukushima disaster where DigiBeta became super scarce. You couldn't get it. People were, were going through archives of tape just to find uh, stock that they could use for, for delivery that it finally killed it off and, and we moved on to digital transfers um, entirely for the studio and and in and other areas of the business where in the entertainment in general you would send out talents on press tours around the world you can't do that in the COVID situation so now we're doing that all like this over over teleconferencing and everyone is saying that it doesn't make sense to put your actors your talents in a hotel room for for an entire day for for days on end just getting barraged by questions from reporters and just sometimes they can even damage the film if they have a if didn't get enough sleep or they're jet lagged and so mm -hmm. this is probably going to be the, the, the way it's going to be handled going forward it, so sometimes it takes events like this to finally make the industry move and and hopefully you're flexible enough to to realize that and adapt to it um yeah. so that you're not stuck in some some something just because it's always been done that, done that way yeah, a colleague of mine, uh, Bob Zukas, is a ex-PWC partner, teaches at USC, um, and he works at the board level. He's got a, his organization is the Digital Directors Network. Has just written written a book called Reboot, and it's it's available on on, on Kindle. Which is in in a sense, let's look at COVID and what it's forcing us to do around rebooting the entire way management boards look at risk and his his focus of course is technology risk the the stuff that that, that we're talking about uh, great book uh, introduce introduce systems thinking to board level people which i think is one of those things that is a, is a real game changer if, if you will sam what are your thoughts on on this whole the discipline if you will uh, of, of cyber security so you know many thoughts come to my mind and now I'm wearing the hat of, of, of the business owner, but I also was in the corporate world. So when I was in the corporate world, um, I think primarily it's, it really starts from the top. Uh, it needs to be part of the culture. Um, processes need to really uh, be formed around security. So if, if there's a, a, a new application being onboarded, for example, uh, or new hardware altogether that's being uh, deployed, security needs to be embedded in that exercise of fact-finding and knowing what's being deployed, you know, third-party assessments, all of that around uh, that need, need to happen. Um, you know, user awareness and user education um, should be taken uh, really heavily. Uh, I think more and more um, animation uh, or animated videos in general are, are being uh, now companies are developing it for uh, just user education and awareness in general, making it making the subject more tangible to the end. Mm -hmm. um, so you know there there's that, but I just want to say that you know I, I think it is rather surprising to me uh, when I talk to different folks and different clients how you know security in certain situations not obviously not everyone but it's really being overlooked that uh, you know you, you hear and it's back to the education may, part maybe so you hear certain things like well my email is in the cloud uh without you know mentioning any, any vendors or anything like that but it's in the cloud and i'm secure i'm using their security for mm -hmm. you know spam and, and security uh email security in general i'm good um so there's there's that going through the education that, look, you, you got to understand 
there's a lot more to it. Um, the reason why someone impersonated you in your email because you don't have um, a DMARC, for example, uh, set, you know, that they're not handling that for you. You need to worry about that. So, I mean, it gets a little bit technical. It gets, uh, although it sounds simple. So back to the education com uh, component, uh, as well as just um, uh, spreading the word, I guess. Yeah, yeah you, as, as I'm listening to you, I think it is, it's, a, it's a fabulous little book by Alan Alda, the actor, uh, called something like, would I have this look on my face if I understood what you were saying? Yeah. And it, in some ways, that's, that's the challenge I think that we face that, um, you know, in, in some ways when I hear, you know, like us talking, and then I hear attorneys talking about cyber, and then I hear insurance people talking about cyber, and then I hear boards of directors talking about cyber. It's like the blind men and the elephant. You know, we're all seeing different pieces of this. And it's, it's almost like we need a Rosetta Stone. I mean, I'm saying that more and more to my board at Secure the Village, that, you know, that part of what we need to do this, this culture thing is so pervasive. Uh, it's part of the reason why I, I like the book uh, that, as I said, one of our board members wrote called Cyber Guardian, because it's designed for the home. It's designed for the family. It's freeze your credit or among the things that it, it, it talks about. Uh, but I just see this as a national challenge that we face. In, in, in some sense, are we the people challenge that, uh, you know, we get it at this technology level. I mean, that's, you know, that, that, that's where we live. And, and, and so much of this lives there. But to what all of you said, it's not just technology. We're talking culture. We're talking, you know, in, in the corporation tone at the top. Uh, in the same thing in our government, you know, can we get government at least agreeing on privacy and basic security and things like that? Um, and how do we get this out to the man and woman on the street, the families, the, you know, the receptionists in our business who are the ones who, you know, they get fished and, and the executives in our, our businesses who, who get fished. So uh, with that, I, mean, I, I think we're gonna kind of begin to wrap it up. I'm gonna pass it back to you, Rick, for some final thoughts. And then I know you're gonna bring it back to us for Great. a couple of minutes, but you know, let's kind of take it on home now. Not being strong. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank the uh, panelists for being our speaker this evening. You've come from a long way. So we've got people outside of Los Angeles County being able to join us to this virtual event, which is exciting. Um, one, thank you for your personal time. And second, thank you for sharing your actual experiences that you've encountered in the workplace. And hopefully we'll all be wiser of hearing those, those stories ourselves and smarter going forward. Uh, but yeah, if we can just have a virtual clap, I can't see my video right now, but uh, everyone can thank our audience. We're not in person to do it, but once again, I, I don't think it uh, falls on deaf ears. Thank you. I want to put a plug in here, let you know what AITP is all about. It's all about getting to uh, meet people that you work with in your field that show the same interest, learn more about your career and business opportunities, stay abreast about what's happening in the industry. And it's an opportunity to practice your leadership skills, especially if you're presenting or interacting with, uh, with speakers. And then nothing else, you know, this is a, a lifelong relationship can be built here when you meet these people in the field. So hopefully you take advantage of that, especially when we have face-to-face -face meetings coming forward. So. We want you to stay connected in a world of rapid innovation and new technologies, and that's our, our kind of our charter, trying to help our audience. I want to thank our audience and our panelists both for sharing your time with us this evening. I hope it's been rewarding. Stan, do you have any closing words? Uh, just, I want to thank, first of all, the, the panelists, you guys, Sam and Eugene and Lakshmi, uh, George, you guys were just great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and if I might just share a screen for a moment, sure. uh, let me let's see. Give me access. There we go. Um, yeah, just to put up some secure the village resources, if I might. A um, lot of re lot of webinars on our resource kit, including talking about culture, as we did earlier. We've got a couple of webinars on that. We have a free cybersecurity news of the week comes out every Sunday. Um, and it's got a weekend patch report for home users, particularly valuable. Uh, like this, we do a lot of events. Uh, you can follow us on LinkedIn. And if you're interested, we would love it if you'd consider joining our leadership council. Uh, our, 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 our mission, if you will, is a cyber secure Los Angeles and a cyber secure country. So uh, thank you all for just 
any support you can be to us in, in helping us accompli accomplish our mission. So, so thank you there. Uh, and again, thank you to all of you. And thank you, you know, uh, you know, Roger for uh, inviting me to facilitate this. Uh, and, and Rick, thanks so much. We greatly appreciate your, uh, your support. Thank you all and have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thanks Bye. a lot. Bye.